Would any sane person think that dumpster diving would have stopped Hitler? Or that composting would have ended slavery? Or brought about the eight-hour workday? Or that chopping wood and carrying water would have gotten people out of czarist prisons? Or that dancing around a fire would have helped put in place the Voting Rights Act of 1957 or the Civil Rights Act of 1964? Then why now, with all the world at stake, do so many people retreat into these entirely personal solutions? Part of the problem is that we've been victims of a campaign of systematic misdirection. Consumer culture and the capitalist mindset have taught us to substitute acts of personal lifestyle choices for organised political resistance. The same is true for spiritual enlightenment. This is not organised political resistance. An inconvenient truth helped raise consciousness about global warming. But did you notice that all of the solutions presented had to do with personal consumption, changing light bulbs, inflating tyres, driving half as much, and had nothing to do with shifting power away from corporations or stopping the growth economy that is destroying the planet? Each one of us is a cause of global warming, but each of us can make choices to change that. With the things we buy, the electricity we use, the cars we drive, We can make choices to bring our individual carbon emissions to zero. But even if every person in the United States did everything the movie suggested, US carbon emissions would fall by only 22%. And scientific consensus is that emissions must be reduced by at least 75% worldwide. Or let's talk water. We so often hear that the world is running out of water. People are dying from lack of water. Rivers are dewatered from lack of water. And while this is true, we're told that because of this, we must take shorter showers. But see the disconnect? Because I take showers, I'm responsible for drawing down aquifers? Well, no. More than 90% of the water used by humans is used by agriculture and industry. The remaining 10% is split between municipalities and actual living, breathing individual humans. Collectively, municipal golf courses use as much water as municipal human beings. That's insane. People, both human people and fish people, aren't dying because the world is running out of water. They're dying because the water is being stolen. Well, let's talk energy. Kirkpatrick Sale summarised it well. For the past 15 years, the story has been the same every year. Individual consumption, residential, by private car and so on, is never more than about a quarter of all consumption. The vast majority is commercial, industrial, corporate, by agribusiness and government. He forgot the military. So even if we all took up cycling and wood stoves, it would have a negligible impact on energy use, global warming and atmospheric pollution. Or let's talk waste. In 2005, per capita municipal waste production, basically everything that's put out at the curb, in the United States was about 1,660 pounds. Let's say you're a diehard simple living activist and you reduce this number to zero. You recycle everything. You bring cloth bags shopping. You fix your toaster. Your toes poke out of your old tennis shoes. You're not done yet though. Since municipal waste includes not just residential waste, but also waste from government offices and businesses, you march down to those offices, waste reduction pamphlets in hand, and convince them to cut down on their waste enough to eliminate your share of it. Well, I've got some bad news. The municipal waste accounts for only 3% of total waste production in the United States. I want to be clear. I'm not saying that we shouldn't live simply. I live reasonably simply myself. But I don't pretend that not buying much 
or not driving much or not having kids is a powerful political act or that it's deeply revolutionary because it isn't. Personal change does not equal social change. So how then, and especially with all the world at stake, have we come to accept these utterly insufficient responses? I think part of it is that we're in a double bind. A double bind is when you're given multiple options, but no matter what option you choose, you lose. And withdrawal is not an option. At this point, it should be pretty easy to recognise that every action involving the industrial economy is destructive. And we shouldn't pretend that solar photovoltaics, for example, exempt us from this. They still require mining and transportation infrastructures at every point in the production process. The same can be said for every other so-called green technology. If we choose option one, if we avidly participate in the industrial economy, we may think in the short term we win, because we may accumulate wealth, the marker of so-called success in this culture, but we lose, because in so doing we give up our empathy, our animal humanity, and we really lose because industrial civilization is killing the planet, which means everyone loses. And if we choose the alternative option of living more simply, thus causing less harm, but still not stopping the industrial economy from killing the planet, we may in the short term think we win because we got to feel pure and we didn't even have to give up all of our empathy, you know, just enough to justify not stopping the horror, but once again we really lose because industrial civilization is killing the planet, which means everyone still loses. The third option, acting decisively to stop the industrial economy, is very scary for a number of reasons, including but not restricted to the fact that we lose some of the luxuries, for example electricity, to which we've grown very accustomed and the fact that those in power might try to kill us if we seriously impede their ability to exploit the world. None of which alters the fact that it's a better option than a dead planet. Any option is a better option than a dead planet. Besides being ineffective at causing the sorts of changes necessary to stop this culture from killing the planet, there are at least four other problems with perceiving simple living as a political act, as opposed to living simply because that's what you want to do. The first is that it's predicated on the flawed notion that humans inevitably harm their land base. Simple living as a political act consists solely of harm reduction, ignoring the fact that humans can help the earth as well as harm it. We can rehabilitate streams, we can get rid of noxious invasives, we can remove dams. We can disrupt a political system tilted towards the rich, as well as an extractive economic system. We can destroy the industrial economy that is destroying the real physical world. The second problem, and this is another big one, is that it incorrectly assigns blame to the individual, and most especially to individuals who are particularly powerless, instead of to those who actually wield power in this system, and to the system itself. The third problem is that it accepts capitalism's redefinition of us from citizens to consumers. By accepting this redefinition, we reduce our potential forms of resistance to consuming and not consuming. But citizens have a much wider range of available resistance tactics, including voting or not voting, running for office, pamphleting, boycotting, organising, lobbying, protesting, and when a government becomes destructive of life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness, we have the right to alter or abolish it. The fourth problem is that the end point of the logic behind simple living as a political act is suicide. 
If every act within an industrial economy is destructive, and if we want to stop this destruction, and if we are unwilling or unable to question, much less destroy, the intellectual, moral, economic and physical infrastructures that cause every act within an industrial economy to be destructive, then we can easily come to believe that we will cause the least destruction possible if we're dead. The good news is that there are other options. We can follow the examples of brave activists who lived through the difficult times I mentioned. Nazi Germany, Tsarist Russia, Antebellum United States, who did far more than manifest a form of personal purity. They actively opposed the injustices that surrounded them. We can follow the example of those who remembered that the role of an activist is not to navigate systems of oppressive power with as much personal integrity as possible but rather to confront and take down those systems. Let's get to work.